extended a part of the palace as far as the forum and turned the temple of Castor and Pollux, a sacred site built to commemorate a military victory in 484 BC, into a vestibule. He often took his place between statues of the demigod sons of Zeus and had himself worshipped. To make matters worse, he set up a temple solely used for his own worship, attended by priests. In the temple was a life-size statue of him in gold. One of the strangest displays of Caligula's sense of grandeur came from his attempts to mimic Xerxes' pontoon bridges. Greek historian Herodotus describes this bridge in his histories as a row of ships that allowed the Persian ruler to cross the Hellespont, the strait separating Anatolia from Greece, and he did so in 480 BC during the second Persian invasion of Greece. Caligula, as recounted in the histories of Suetonius and fellow historian Dio, wanted to project the image of a conquering hero to his subjects, and he tried to do the same. Baiae and the mole at Puteoli, a distance of three miles, bridged by bringing together merchant ships and anchoring them in a double line, a mound of earth heaped on them and fashioned in the style of the Appian Way, a major Roman road. Caligula rode over this bridge back and forth for two successive days. On the first day, he rode a richly decorated horse, himself adorned with a crown made of oak leaves, along with a buckler, a sword, and a cloak made of golden cloth. On the second day, he wore the dress of a charioteer in a car drawn by a pair of horses, carrying before him a hostage boy from Rome's eastern enemy of the Parthian Empire. On the bridge were rooms and even whole houses with drinking water in them. While Caligula rode across these ships in his gorgeous raiment, he gave a banquet to his men, and in the end, hurled many guests off the bridge into the sea. Many of them drowned. The entire Praetorian Guard was called to attend the spectacle, along with a company of his friends in Gallic chariots. Caligula believed himself to have outdone Xerxes, since the Hellespont was a much narrower gap than the gap between Baie and the Mole at Puteoli. Caligula may have also done this to inspire fear in the northern European provinces of Germania and Britannia, ancient analogs to Germany and Britain, which he had designs to conquer. Whether by demonstrating his construction abilities or showing off his so-called military prowess. Classicist M.P. Charlesworth doubts the accounts of the Bridge of Baie from Dio and Suetonius. He considers the latter prone to basing his stories on the wildest gossip about Caligula, including such stories about habitual incest with all his three sisters, or wallowing in gold, or plans for universal poisoning. Simple physics would also refute the boat bridge story. Bridging the three-mile distance between Puteoli and Baie would be impossible due to the number of ships needed. Deploying so many ships would bankrupt the empire. Dio at least acknowledges the absurdity of this project. He writes that so many boats were requisitioned that it disturbed the Mediterranean importing of grain from Egypt to Italy, triggering a famine. Different writers also place a story at separate times in Caligula's reign. Josephus and Seneca place a story a few months before Caligula's assassination. Dio and Suetonius place it two years into his four-year reign. While it is plausible that Caligula was mad enough to try to outdo Xerxes with a boat bridge, the fantastic details of the facts of the story make it implausible. So whatever the historicity of Caligula's Bridge of Baie, Suetonius rattles off other examples of Caligula's innate madness and brutality. Gladiatorial shows were notably violent under his rule. For the spectacle, wild beasts were fed cattle, but the emperor thought they were too expensive, so criminals were devoured instead. He reviewed the line of prisoners without examining any charges and took his place in the middle of a colonnade, commanding them to be led away from bald head to bald head. As a newly coronated emperor, Caligula sought glory in battle and the status of a war leader. But rather than achieve real victory, he went through the motions of a military campaign and borrowed the symbols of victory without earning them. Caligula launched only one campaign as emperor, and it originated from what appeared to be a sudden and irrational impulse. Having gone to visit the springs at a river in modern-day Umbria, Italy, he remembered the need to recruit Batavian bodyguards, the Germanic foreign-born soldiers who traditionally protected the emperors. Caligula then had the idea of an expedition to Germania. The emperor assembled legions and auxiliaries, exacted levies, and raised vast amounts of money to fund the campaign, while collecting provisions on a scale that made Julius Caesar's Gaul campaign appear modest. He began the march and made it so hurriedly that the Praetorian cohorts had to suffer the shame of laying their standards on pack animals 
an insult to their dignity as elite soldiers. But Caligula, the chronicler reminds us, was so lazy that he rode around in a litter carried by eight bearers, ordering townspeople to sweep the roads before him and sprinkle water to settle the dust. The officers and soldiers held Caligula in barely concealed contempt for forcing them on such a fast march while he traveled in ease, but he was oblivious to their hatred. On reaching his camp, to show his vigilance as a commander, he dismissed the generals who arrived late from far-flung provinces. While renewing troop strength, he canceled pensions of many of the chief centurions, some who were only a few days away from retirement, or reduced the rewards given on completion of full military service to 6,000 sesterces, or about four years' worth of salary. The upshot of this unnecessary force march was the surrender of the exiled Britain chief, Adminius, who had been banished by his father, Cunobeline, and had deserted to the Romans with a small force. Caligula, with typical theatrics, treated the surrender of this band of exiles as if the entire British island had surrendered to him. He wrote a letter to Rome, demanding couriers to ride at full speed to the Forum and the Senate. Despite the so-called surrender, Caligula found nobody to fight with on the European continent or a battle that would allow him to achieve and boast a victory. If a real conquest wasn't possible, then a fake one would have to do. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. He ordered the Germans of his Batavian bodyguards taken across the river and concealed there. They sent word that an enemy force was nearby. On the news, he rushed out with a part of the Praetorian cavalry to the woods to do battle with imaginary foes. After cutting a few tree branches and adorning them in a manner like trophies, he returned by torchlight, mocking those who hadn't followed in their cowardice. He presented his companions and the partners in his victory with crowns ornamented with figures of the sun, moon, and stars. Finally, as if he were drawing this war to a close, Caligula drew up a line of battle on the shore of the English Channel and arranged his ballistas and other artillery. When no one could imagine his next action, he suddenly ordered them to collect shells and put them in their helms and folds of their gowns. The shells were spoils from the ocean due to the capital and palatine. He then promised the soldiers a hundred denarii each as gratuity, as if he'd been exceedingly generous up to this point. Go your way happy, go your way rich, Caligula said. After the campaign, Caligula purportedly crafted a victory parade that took far more effort than the original military action. He wrote to his financial agents to prepare for the triumph at the smallest possible cost, but for the victory celebration at the grandest possible scale. The Romans showcase a cast of defeated enemies. Caligula, as if you were a casting agent, selected the tallest of his troops and reserved them for his parade. The emperor compelled them to dye their hair red and let it grow long, learn the Germanic language, and take barbarian names to appear as if they were conquered Batavians. The Airsat's triumph and four celebrations were another occasion for Caligula to show disrespect for the Senate. His dealings with senators were a break in protocol from the reign of the seclusive Tiberius, during which the Senate had done most of the decision-making on its own. Caligula did what he could to shame, embarrass, and humiliate senators individually and collectively. To do so, he treated his horse, Incatatus, with more respect than them. In addition to his fine garments, he also served as a royal host. When invitations were sent from the palace, they were in the horse's name, and Incatatus could dine at the emperor's table. Roman historians claim Caligula tried to make Incatatus either a senator or a priest before the emperor's death. Modern classicists have argued that Caligula wasn't intentionally malicious, but a victim of his own cult of personality. Early 20th century British historian J.P.V.D. Ballston blames the manipulative Senate for stoking Caligula's arrogance, leading to a belief in his divinity so that he could be better controlled. Caligula accepted honors without reservation and removed or executed advisors who could have helped him in dealing with tributes and flatterers. Wealthy citizens fed his cult of personality to secure well-compensated priesthood positions in his new cult. The most toe-curling acts of Caligula's madness concern his incestuous relations with his sisters. Suetonius claims Caligula lived in habitual carnal relations with all of them, but had special affection for Julia Drusilla, whom he may have violated when he was still a minor. When she became the wife of consul Lucius Cassius Longinus, Caligula took her from him and openly treated her as his lawful wife, even making her heir to his property and the throne. 
When she died in 38 AD, Caligula appointed a season of public mourning, declaring it a capital crime to express merriment or feast with one's parents, wife, and children. Consumed with grief at Drusilla's death, Caligula fled Rome, went to Syracuse, and returned in a disheveled state without cutting his hair or shaving his beard. A shameful and disheveled look for an emperor. From that moment on, Suetonius states that Caligula never took an oath on important matters, even in public assemblies before soldiers and citizens, except by the godhead of Drusilla. Historians have tried to make sense of Caligula's madness since the Roman Empire. First-hand biographical accounts come from six Roman sources. Two writers, Philo of Alexandria and Seneca the Younger, knew him personally. Two other writers, Tacitus and Josephus, were born too late to know him, but they had access to Roman politicians and courtiers who did know Caligula. The final writers were the historian Suetonius, author of Lives of the Caesars, and Dio, author of Roman History, who penned their works generations after the death of Caligula, 80 and 190 years respectively. The further removed in time the writers were from the emperor, the more outlandish the stories become. The scribes may have let their imaginations get the best of them, or maybe they weren't under the threat from partisan hatchet men like Seneca and Philo were, who lived during the life of Caligula, and were able to write more critically. The earlier generations of writers offered balance to the story of Caligula's reign, and the later accounts turned him to a sort of monster from a brother's grim tale. These historians thought that Caligula's madness resulted from two faults. First, extreme assurance. Second, excessive fearfulness. They described him as hating and fearing the gods to such a degree that he shut his eyes and covered his ears at the slightest thunder and lightning, terrified at the wrath of Zeus. If the storm increased, he leapt from his bed and hid under it. In a similar incident, on a journey through Sicily, he mocked so-called miracles attributed to the gods. And yet, he became panic-stricken one night when the Sicilian stratovolcano erupted, spewing smoke. Mortal threats equally terrified Caligula. When he rode in a chariot on the far side of the Rhine River, it was said that there could be mass panic if the enemy appeared anywhere near. With speed, he would mount a horse and escape to the bridges. When a lengthy line of camp servants and baggage prevented his crossing, soldiers moved the emperor hand over hand over the crowd. Upon learning of a rebellion in Germania, he prepared to flee Rome and ready to ships for this purpose. New methods of psychological analysis developed in the last century have allowed historians to diagnose Caligula with every mental illness for which professionals have a name. He's been called schizophrenic, psychopathic, epileptic, bipolar, or more simply, a garden variety megalomaniac. Some think that his madness came on suddenly with an illness in 37 AD, while others think it had to do with childhood trauma and parental abandonment. Still, others say that his madness was never as bad as our historical record claims. His crazed actions either never happened and are only a fictional account created by chroniclers who had something to gain by demonizing Caligula and making their own political faction appear better by comparison, or something else. German scholar H. Wilrich wrote in 1903 that the emperor wasn't simply mad, but rather there was a system or method to his alleged madness and that he suffered a breakdown from the stress of his duties as emperor. A recent biography on Caligula by Alois Winterling argues that he may have been manic because his behavior matches symptoms of the illness. Others say he was a product of the Roman imperial system, whose worship of the emperor and indulgent lifestyle could turn anyone insane with delusions of grandeur. Still others don't reach for a complex explanation and write him off as a sociopath with no care about the effect of his monstrous actions on others. But without the ability to perform a psychiatric assessment on Caligula, reaching such conclusions is ultimately impossible. Accounts that are written decades after someone's death, especially by political enemies, are suspicious and lack objectivity. An examination of Caligula's turbulent childhood might be more relevant in explaining his adult behavior. Arthur Farrell, a modern-day biographer of the emperor, argues that the path to megalomania began early in his life and the exposure to the execution of mutinous soldiers when he was only a toddler triggered a lifelong fear of a mutiny of his own, making him paranoid of conspiracy and all too happy to execute anyone perceived as disloyal. Roman accounts of Caligula's abnormal behavior suggest an anxiety disorder. He's often described as petulant and excitable, even in normal circumstances. 
His condition was therefore likely triggered by the stress of his.